Welcome to the Coach V Show, your Hollywood radio show for personal development, bringing you expert insights and interviews so you can level up in life, leadership, and business. Today is fire. Fire. We got Brother Sionel Vili dropping his story of all the struggle that he has had to overcome in his life story, his shout outs and all of great and amazing experiences that he's going to share here on the show. Stay tuned because now a word from our sponsor. This year as we gather for the holidays, it's important to keep our Ohana safe and sound. Vaccines have been approved for kids like us, ages 5 to 11. Now we are Join our older siblings, family, and friends in being safer. Stay safe and enjoy the holidays by washing our hands, wearing our masks, and of course, get back! To the Coach V Show, your Hollywood radio show for personal development with expert insights and interviews to help you, me, and we work to be our best and live our best life. Offering for your consideration success frameworks, behavioral models, and life lessons that should you find value in them, deploy it all over your life, leadership, and business, and into the marketplace and level up. Today, we are so excited here on the Coach V Show on Island City, where the beach meets the streets, to bring to you Brother Sione Havili. Sione, whose parents originate from the island kingdom of Tonga, was born and raised as a first-generation American citizen in Glendale, Utah, and is the oldest of eight kids. His father, Devita, um, Havili recently retired after driving the city bus and school bus for 38 years. His mother, Elva uh, Kinikini, was homemaker who served as the CEO of the Havili household and successfully raised eight Havili children. After graduating from East High School in Salt Lake City, uh, shout out East High and my boy Sonu Tafisi, also from East High. Sione signed a letter of intent to play football at Brigham Young University. Prior to enrolling at BYU, he decided to serve his two-year LDS church mission and was assigned to go to New York City. Unfortunately, after 14 months in New York City, he was implicated in some gang activity prior to leaving on his mission, extradited home to Salt Lake City, convicted of first degree felony, and served time to pay his debt to society. Upon his release, Sione earned an associate's degree from El Camino Community College in Torrance, California, before earning a scholarship to Texas Tech University, where he played football and graduated as an honor student with a bachelor's degree in human development and family studies in 2005. Sione Havili is currently the director of customer expansion at Domo Inc., a tech company uh, that is based in American Fork, Utah. He's the vice chair of the Utah Polynesian Professionals and is a passionate about helping other Pacific Islanders and then women as well in terms of all that they are doing and the underrepresented uh, through job opportunities in tech. He also has a strong, is a strong advocate in all that he does in helping in the workplace. He speaks to youth and groups often across the country to share his unique and the struggle that is in his life story. And then also earlier this year, shown his childhood idol and now mentor, Vi Skahammer. Shout out to Vi Skahammer, 
the uh, man, one of my favorite figures in the Tongan society and in general in the world, um, helped produce a compelling documentary on his remarkable life journey titled Redeemed. In that, uh, the Sione Habili story, he is happily married to his high school sweetheart, Lini Ki Oa. They have five beautiful kids, Destiny, Staten, Sione, Lena, and Solo E. Solo E and currently reside in Sandy, Utah. What a bio and a Coach V Show audience. Welcome to the show, your boy, Shone Habili. Shone, welcome to the show. Miami, thank you. It is truly a pleasure. Man, the pleasure is mine. I mean, we started off your bio and I, I know about your story, uh, but just reading it again, just reminds uh, me of why I wanted to have you on the show. Because not only are you successful now, but you, like many of us, have gone through some self-sabotage, uh, some choices that uh, weren't great choices, but yet you have rebounded and built a life that is a model for a lot of folks. Shone, you just tell us the story. What is your genesis point? And please share that story with us, Brother Shone. Absolutely. Well, Coach B, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of your show. I've listened to almost every single podcast interview that you had. And so it's just, it's humbling uh, to be a part of, of the cast that you have here. Very star-studded, esteemed guests. And so nonetheless, uh, a, a big fan of, of really all the, the, the content that you shared and the goodness that you provide in this world. Um, so interestingly enough, I'd like to start in the middle. Yes, sir. You know, I know yes, sir. a lot of I know a lot of your, your guests typically start at the beginning. And the yes, reason sir. why it was is a, a very pivotal point in my life. Mm -hmm. So about 10 years ago, um, well, yeah, about 10 years ago, there was an acquisition, a tech acquisition, uh, a company called Adobe, which you're probably familiar with in the yep, Bay Area, yep. had acquired an up and coming web analytics company here in Utah called Omnitra. And they had purchased that company for $2 billion. Um, it really piqued my interest because I had a couple of friends working for Omniture and in these tech acquisitions, as you can imagine, uh, people make some pretty good coin. Right. And so right. I was interested. I'm like, all right, cool. I need to get into tech. Well, come to find out, um, Adobe had a couple entry level opportunities. And so I had thrown my name in the hat, secured an interview, and with these tech interviews, it's interesting because it's not one-on-one. -on -one. Like your initial interview is a panel and it's not a panel of just normal folks. It's a panel of typically director or VP level executives. Right. And so when I throw my name in the hat, uh, come to find out there, there were a couple hundred people that had tried to interview for these entry level roles, probably for the same reason that I did. Um, and as I was going through this initial interview, I still remember it like it was yesterday. I could tell that the line of questioning that they had was as if they were trying to sift through their candidates, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And trying to really find things that, that really allowed them to move on. And, and, and as I, I started to sense that, I, I had an epiphany. I had an idea that I never thought I would enter an interview or start an interview this way. But I says, if you guys are, are, are looking you know, for wrongs in candidates, you're gonna find more wrong in me than anyone else. Mm. Now, as you can imagine, no one, no one of you typically starts that way. The room went right, quiet. Right, right, right. And so the VP that was in the room just said, well, what quite possibly could we find wrong in you that we've never seen in anyone else? And I said, I'm a first degree convicted felon. Right. And wow. they didn't ask any questions. From that point on, for the next 30 to 35 minutes, I was able to tell my story. And after that point, they went straight to, the, to high level executives at, right. at Adobe in San Jose and received approval to hire me. And so um, that, that was the catalyst point of, of my life and my career. And so I'd like to start from the beginning, right? A lot of people tell this story. Once I got hired, it was really easy for other people to take a chance on me. But, but that point, uh, and even before that, it, it was never that easy. So I, I was born and raised in Glendale, Utah. Uh, just the west side of Salt Lake City, a very diverse community. Um, you, 
just a hard working class, right? My right, parents right. migrated from Tonga. My dad, Tevita, he's from Hatejo. My mom is from Uija. And we had very, very humble beginnings. Uh, my dad never made more than $45,000 a year raising eight kids. But interestingly enough, we never felt like we went without, mm -hmm. right? Because we always live within our means. But my dad just taught us, as he probably learned in Tonga, that we needed to work hard, we needed to be resourceful, and nothing was given to us. We had to earn every single bit of it. Um, and so that was essentially the foundation. I mean, when we talk about working hard, you know, my dad made us or, or you know, requested that we get paper routes, taught us how to, you know, jump in dumpsters and collect aluminum cans and newspapers so that we could recycle those monthly uh, or every couple months, mow lawns, shovel snow. Um, you know, even during the summertime, something as simple as free lunches, right? In, in, a, in a community where, you know, the income levels are really, really low, every single elementary school within a stone's throw away has free lunch. And my dad taught us, if you guys want to eat, like get on your bikes and, you know, eat three, four, five free lunches a day in the summertime. Like it was our most favorite time of the year because, you know, we could kai up anytime we uh, want, uh. you know, during the summertime. So, yeah, I mean, that was the foundation. But, but the other thing, you know, obviously like any Tongan upbringing, um, you know, there was just a strong foundation and faith instilled in Christ. Right. And that was just part of our, our mantra. Our people are very God fearing people, as are a lot of ethnic folks. Uh, but but I think with with Tongans in, in general, it's very specific. You can see in the flag. Right. right. The flag itself, white signifies purity, red, the blood of Christ, the cross. You know, everything that we do is is, you know, based on that. And so that was the premise and the foundation of my life. Wow. And, and then to jump in to it, I mean, not only is it an audacious way to start an interview and a splash in terms of creating a relationship and trust and loyalty <laughs> and that they be given an opportunity, there's an audacity there, but then also an unapologeticness about, hey, this is who I am and who you are, Shone. And, and talk more about that and where that comes from. Yeah, it's a really good point. You know, one thing that I've noticed that really separates, I mean, everybody is just, we all have a unique story to tell. Uh, I often post on social media and one of the main hashtags that I put, put out there is to tell your story. Mm. Uh, my first year at Adobe, I was, I, I was actually instructed by a leader uh, not to share my story. Right, he, right, right. He said right. it was considered a CLM, which is a career limiting move. And for about three days, because I revered this individual, I thought to myself, is that the pathway that I want to take? And then I realized, no, each of our stories, each of our decisions, whether good or bad, really build the premise of who we are today, individually, and how we can contribute collectively to the whole. And, and in that, what I've, what I've marveled from you, um, besides the fact that you know, the epiphany hit that you're Stanley Habili's brother. Like when I first contacted you and we connected, I was like, man, I've talked on the phone a handful of times during recruiting with Stanley, is that you're so well-spoken and you can articulate a precise message with just laser precision, like your use of wordage and words and, and adages and then sayings. Like I've had so many Tongan guests here, but they've never referred to how the flag actually represents our faith. Where does that come from, Sione? Yeah. You know, it's interesting um, only because early on when I got into tech, uh, people were just like, why are you different? And as I did more and more research on our heritage, not just Tonga, Pacific mm -hmm. Islanders in general, most of our ancestors would navigate the open waters with the constellation of the stars, the currents, and the temperatures, as if it yep. were the highways, right? Getting yep. from California to Salt Lake City uh, in a cinch. And that part, I think, gets lost, is mm. that a lot of times people see that our, you know, that, that Tongan Samoans 
you know, whatever it might be, we're, we're barbaric. We're very good at football, right? Mm -hmm. We come from a very warrioristic uh, mentality or culture, but deep down inside, we are also very, very innovative and our ancestors were brilliant. And so those are one of the things that I, that I spend a lot of time on is, is I study and I read, and I try to read a lot on history, right? Because we're, if we do things right, we're not gonna have to reinvent the wheel. And I think our heritage is a, a very good foundational base uh, to really catapult us so that we can you know, obviously learn from, from our ancestors. No, I love that. I love that. Um, because first and foremost, you know, I'm, I'm one of the only Polynesians out here in my region and my area that's under 220 pounds, right? Because they're just like, are, are you sure you're Tongan? Um, but that that just doesn't define us. There are a multitude of layers that make up a community, that make up a society and a people. And then amongst that is that there is an academic acuity and intelligence that's within us to be able to navigate, figure things out, design, create a plan, and reach destinations that most people will drown in trying to figure out. But we just always just want to plug into what our initial reaction is, is that we can overwhelm and overcome just through hard work and or physical activity. As I say that, um, Shonen, what does that make you think and feel as you really well put in terms of how you are articulated, what we are. We are this, but we are also that, Shone. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've noticed by some of your, your other podcast interviews is we kind of talk about the clash and the intersection of cultures. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> it's just interesting because I think there are good in the Tongan or Polynesian culture. And there's some things that make it a little bit prohibitive for us here, here in America. Um, one, one particular example is I was going through school. I didn't, I didn't do as well as, you know, you would think I did primarily just because in the Tongan culture, we're taught not to make eye contact with someone. Right, 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 right. Right. We're taught not to talk back. And in reality, what that means is, is we don't ask questions. That's right. I didn't really ask any questions until halfway through my college career when I realized it's okay to have dialogue with someone, you know, of authority. Um, and then it, it really hit me hard. Um, my son, he's, he's a junior now, but when he was in second grade, he was sent to the principal's office because every time he asked or he was asked a question by the teacher, he responded by raising his eyebrows. And essentially the teacher thought that he was not, he was not paying attention right. in the Tongan culture that is a sign of I'm listening. I acknowledge me, right? Yeah. I'm saying yes. And so there was an element where we had to sit down with, you know, the elementary administration and help them understand he is interacting, he is responding, but in our culture, it's just a little bit different. And so it's been an evolution, right? And now my, my dad and I, we have a great relationship. In high school, it was always one-way conversations. And that was just how we were taught. And so I've adapted and I've tried to adapt the way that I've parented my own kids uh, and the way I've, I've developed relationships in, in my own professional career. Yeah, that, that is remarkable, right? Where we do have to be able to listen and communicate not only with what we say, but our body language and what our body and our mannerisms say. That, that's, so, that's so important. So talk about this. Let, let's unpack the football aspect and yeah. some life lessons that you learned. I mean, East High is renowned. I mean, because I live down the street from Jesuit High School, I think East and Jesuit in terms of rugby national championships and rugby. Um, and then so I know about that that whole deal and have at least a perception of what East is in terms of um, football football level and and there's there's some folks so new to see my cousin i believe played there at east um and how was that experience and how did that form who it is that you are today and some life lessons for us please yeah believe it or not east high wasn't always that great right uh, is yeah, that true when i was in when i was coming up in junior high and elementary school there was actually an article published on east high that they were the worst high school football team in the country 
Yeah, yeah. I think they were going six years of not winning a game. Wow. And yeah, it was interesting because I started going to football camp and I went to, to the University of Utah football camp. There was a guy there by the name of Ron McBride. And one of the cool things about the football camp is we got to intermingle in the dorms with some of their current players. One of the players that I really, really connected strongly with was a gentleman by the name of Jamal Anderson. Mm. Uh, you probably remember the Dirty Bird from the Atlanta. Yeah, the running back. Yeah. Yeah. So he was one of the running backs in the University of Utah. He was, you know, drafted late, fifth round. But I, every summer I had a chance to interact with him. And one of the, the, the questions that I asked him was, you know, and this is a question a lot of people, kids nowadays are, are, are uh, faced with, is like, do I go to my local high school or, or do I try to go somewhere else to get some visibility or exposure? Mm. And so he decided to stay at his local high school and he advised that I try to build up the kids in the no neighborhood to do the same. Well, mm. coincidentally, we had a lot of talent. Jason Galfusi yeah. uh, just left UCLA to go to Arizona East coaching. Shonet Bowaha. Um, you know, Nuu, Nata yeah. Tafisi, my brother Etu, Fui Bakapuna, Will Tukwafu. Like there was a pool of future NFL guys that were in my high school. Um, yeah. And so we decided, we made a pack as a group. Hey, you know what? Let's go to East and let's just do our thing. And it was kind of cool because my freshman year, we went, we went 0 and, 0 and 9. The very next year, we actually took our team to the state championship. And then the following year, and now, if you look on, uh, it was interesting. I had a conversation with a good friend of mine. I mean, if you look at the rosters of D1 football this year, um, Baylor, Oklahoma State, Washington, Stanford, BYU, Utah, Utah State, the list goes on and on. They, there are players from East High rosters right. that are making an impact. Right. Uh, there. And right. So it's just, it's, it's, I know, you know, Kahuku and, you know, Long Beach and Carson. Yeah. They're known for rich football talent. And I would venture out to say that Glendale and Rose Park in Salt Lake City, Utah, where Halotti and, you know, Nata and Tony Finau came from, um, have just as much rich talent as, as a lot of these other places. And so it was kind of a hotbed and it kind of worked out when you talk about this perfect storm boiling together. Right. Uh, when we decided to go and kind of turn the program around. And as a result, a lot of us ended up catapulting our lives and careers by earning college scholarships and making an impact there. Yeah, those names, wow. Tony Finau, man, everybody's like out here, cause I run a golf tournament out here for our nonprofit. They're like, man, you, you tonguing like Tony Finau? I was like, yeah, the, Tony's half, uh, we're Polynesian. The dude put us on the map in so many ways. I just don't play golf like Tony. <laughs> I just do not even, but I love golf and all those names that you mentioned, what a legacy and a lineage of young men that came from Rose Park in the Glendale area there. In that, let, let's talk about going on your mission and then this implication, um, this coming back and having to serve time. Talk about that that whole ordeal and and how can we watch that 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 deal that you and Vi produced and put out there? Uh, just talk about that whole deal and the lessons it is that you'd like the public to know is that this is the reason why I put out that story. And if you you've alluded to it already, like we all have a story and we don't have to hide from it. But specifically that feature and how and why you rolled it out that way. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so I, I did well enough for, I was recruited by quite a few different schools. Obviously I signed with BYU, um, but the tough thing in high school, and I think that's a cultural clash that a lot of our kids are dealing with. I had two groups of friends, right? Mm, real One, talk. the Jason Galfusis and the Sione Fowas yep. and so on that aspired to go to college. Yeah, yeah. And then another group that were just trying to put in work for the neighborhood. And so yep. it was just interesting because, you know, anytime I tried to, you know, go to class and do good things. I was always accused of being fiat balangi, right? Uh, or trying to be, uh, you know, trying to do something good. And so I was always trying to piece both. Anyways, long story short, I ended up going on my mission. Uh, but prior to going on my mission, um, you know, to spare any details, because it's not anything that I want to boast about. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a drive-by shooting at one of my friend's house. We ended up retaliating. Um, and, but, but after the retaliation, I didn't talk to anybody. I ended up going on my mission anyways. And I was about, I was out for about 14 months and I received a phone call 
that I was implicated is, you know, a, a, a willing participant and or potentially even a mastermind, as they were saying, you know, of this retaliation. And so I was extradited home and I left New York City and ended up going straight to jail. Lost everything. Lost my scholarship to BYU. You know, obviously, as you can imagine, things were on the up and up. And so it, it was tough. Uh, after, you know, a little while, uh, I ended up going through court proceedings and uh, there weren't any witnesses. Uh, there wasn't any real, real evidence, but because I didn't say anything and nobody really was, uh, I was offered a plea deal where if I took a first degree felony, because I was facing 15 years to life, um, that they would just give me one year. And so I essentially, you know, after consulting with my wife, uh, who was my girlfriend at the time and my parents, I'm not a gambler. So I took it mm. and uh, believe it or not, really, I mean, it was the best experience of my life mm, uh, unpack I mean, that unpack that yeah unpack yeah that. well as you can imagine if you have one year where you have no worries you have no responsibilities you can either one thing that my old you know football coach his name's kiko george of the city east he used to teach us this very important principle that i've used every single day in my life you're either getting stronger or you're getting weaker mm. you're never staying the same and so I decided to use that one year every single minute to better myself. And so I found out that, well, first of all, I, I decided to read. So when you talk about being well-spoken, when you talk about being articulate, I read hundreds, if not thousands of books during my time when I was down. Um, I, I found out that there was ways where you could get time off, right? If you end up getting your GED or uh, graduate from Alcoholics Anonymous or anger management, right? I didn't have those issues, but essentially I wanted to do things that I could step out of my comfort zone. And then there was a trusty position uh, known as the librarian. And the librarian is the most coveted trustee position because you're out of general population for six to eight hours a day. And you're basically the middleman. Everyone's, you know, obviously dealing through and with you. And so I had a goal that I wanted to be you know, the, the jailhouse or prison librarian. And two months later, I became that. And, and my motivation was a little bit different. It wasn't because I cut, coveted this role. It's because it would take me two weeks to get three new books. And I wanted the ability to consume knowledge, you know, at a faster rate than just getting three books every two weeks. And so once I got in the library, I'll tell you what, Coach B, I read as much as I possibly could. I tried to get my work done in two to three hours. And then the rest you know, of the day, I would just read as much as I possibly could. And it was, it was a phenomenal experience. Wow, way to unpack that. It's so intriguing, right? Because really at its most, most basic core level to make a living in America or anywhere on the world, you need to be able to give value or present value to the marketplace. And then the marketplace now returns some type of compensation for that value. Is that not true? Is that not true, Sim? Yes. Right. But in that, I, I often tell students, especially college students, in terms of their choices uh, are, are going to have consequences. Decisions determine their destiny is that there are just as many or more knowledgeable people that are in the prisons that I've went and spoke to. I've just been really fortunate to get some just amazing opportunities to be in places really I, I shouldn't really normally be in. And I found in the conversations in there that people, I'm just like, man, if this guy, but he's serving 20 to L at 40 years old, and he's never going to have a chance to now translate that knowledge that he has into the marketplace, ever getting some type of compensation, even though he knows more than the average population that's out there. Come on, come on, sell me. Right. <laughs> and, and, but, right. And, and, but it's just so interesting that in in you could you could have this knowledge, but if you make the wrong decisions, you not you will never be able to maximize those opportunities with the marketplace interaction. Is that true or not true, Sim? 100 percent. And right. I think I'm a direct product that I was lucky enough to really gain that knowledge while I was while I was locked up and leverage they get it. out. <laughs> Right. hundred percent. I mean, I, I saw it was very cyclical. I would see guys come in and out. And right. really, my goal was I will never perpetuate this process. Mm. I will make sure that when I go out that I'm going to be a better person and I'm going to be an impact on the community. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, after I ended up serving my time, interestingly enough, I, I was trying to get back on track. And so, I, you know, the only people that would allow me to, to really continue on my football career was Coach Ron McBride due to that relationship with the University of Utah. And so it was, you know, I, I knew I had to prove myself academically. But one thing that's really interesting when you talk about, you know, offering value, right, that's something that you've noticed you know, when you're locked up, I think that's just something inherent with their, within our culture. Right. I've learned that the, the, that the most powerful leaders in the Polynesian culture, when you go from, you know, kind of the, the, the warriors to the chiefs to the kings, is two reasons why they became in the positions that they were. Number one, because they, they obviously were the toughest. And number two, because they could provide for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I, I like that comment that you shared primarily because within the Polynesian culture, that's how wealth is, is demonstrated by giving, mm. whether it's monetary, whether it's knowledge and not so much by, you know, retaining, right. Mm. As you've seen, you've seen in maybe Western cultures. Um, so yeah, so I ended up transferring to the university of Utah. I had to prove myself academically. Um, one of the, one, one of the most pivotal individuals was another guest that you had, Steve Fifita. Yeah. Steve Fifita happened to be at the university of Utah that same year I was, and he was gray shirty. Um, and, you know, obviously he came from a family who was a lot better well off than, than I was. He was living in the dorms. And one of the benefits is he had a meal plan, right? And here's right. a kid that had no money. And so every single day he could take one free guest with him into the cafeteria. And luckily I was the beneficiary of- He chose uh, you. <laughs> yeah. Every single day. And so I, after your show with him, I actually- Text him, he and I had a really good conversation, how grateful I, I was for someone like him to be able to take someone like me that didn't have the same resources under his wing to make sure that he could fill that void that I really, really needed at that point in my life. That's awesome, man, that you guys attracted into each other's life that way and being at the same place. So talk about El Camino um, and then ending up at Texas Tech. How did that all happen, Shoni? Yeah, so it did, it, so... <laughs> My journey at Utah was abrupt. So I was there for an entire year because of my situation, transferring from BYU, I had to prove myself academically. Mm -hmm. uh, after three semesters, I had earned a 3.8 GPA. Uh, I was getting ready to actually uh, participate in fall camp and they were going to the big house in 2002. And then I found out on the radio by the, that the athletic director had kicked me off of the football team and I was expelled. So. Um, I was recruited by BYU at BYU by a guy named Norm Chow, and he was at USC at the time. Mm -hmm. And so he had, he had advised that I get in touch with a guy named John Featherstone, uh, recently passed away earlier this year. Yes. And so I ended up going to El Camino College in 2002 and had a really good, you know, had a, had a really good year. Uh, they had never seen a big tailback before, uh, you know, 6'2", 250. And then I ended up going through the recruitment process. And this is where I think set the foundation of how I approached the Adobe interview. Mm -hmm. Because when I went through the recruitment process again, I asked Coach Featherstone, when you talk to these coaches, make sure that you can um, facilitate a face-to-face -face interview with the school presidents and or chancellors. Because mm -hmm. I wanted them to know who I was. I wanted them to know the baggage that I carried. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Featherstone tried his best. And at the end, it just came down to Fresno State, Pat Hill and Texas Tech, Mike Leach. Mm -hmm. And uh, because Robert and I was at Texas Tech and there was just a familiar face, uh, I decided to go to Texas Tech. And that's how I ended up in Lubbock, Texas. Lubbock, Texas. What are the life lessons from Lubbock, Texas, Yone? Oh, man, West Texas. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because- With the wizard at the helm. Yeah, he was- <laughs> With he, Mike Leach. <laughs> He was known as the mad scientist. You yeah, know, and it's just yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, the guy, he didn't play football. He went to BYU. After BYU, he ends up going to Pepperdine. He gets uh -huh. a law degree. And then after yeah. he gets his law degree, he doesn't practice one day of law. He goes to San Luis Obispo as a volunteer coach. And now he's making, I don't know, five to eight million dollars a year just doing yeah. X's and O's. He's brilliant. Uh, but there were a lot of life lessons there that, you know, I, I ended up, Going there as a running back, the first two games, uh, I started fullback. Uh, on one side, we had Wes Welker. On the other side, we had Dan Danny Amendola. Those guys were getting 15 catches a game. 
and I was getting four carries. I ended up switching over to, to linebacker and defensive end. You know, I didn't have an illustrious career, but I knew my situation. I mean, heck, Coach V, I was out of the game for four years, right? Yeah, second chances, right? Second yeah, chances. Yeah, second chances. Lessons, right? So I maximized the opportunity. Yeah. I did as best as I could in school. I graduated early. And then uh, Coach McBride ended up getting the job at Weber State. So I decided I wanted to finish up my senior year and play running back for him. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up moving to Ogden. Uh, I already had a bachelor's degree. But the tough thing was, is I was there the entire summer. A week before the first game, Coach V, I ended up having a, a collision with the linebacker as I had all the way down to Little League multiple times for the last 10 to 12 years. But this one was different. Uh, it felt like there was some debris in my eye as I wiped it away. It wasn't going away. They ended up sending me to the hospital and come to find out I had a stroke. Oh. And so I, that ended my career. 25 years old, and I ended up going blind in my left eye. I'm still blind in my left eye. Yeah, that, so, what, what a story. So did you end up finishing at Weber, or did you graduate from Texas Tech, and then how did that work out? Yeah, no, I graduated from Texas Tech University, and yep. I, was, I, was gonna, I was in a master's program at Weber, Coach McBride, bless his heart, he's like, hey, let's take a medical. And I'm like, dude, man, I'm 25 years old. I've already been kicked out of BYU. I've already served time. I got kicked out of Utah. I had a stroke. I think the Lord's telling me something. Mm. And so it goes full circle. And I ended up getting a couple, you know, solid years of work history. And then I ended up getting that interview at Adobe. Uh, and that was 10 years ago. And that really catapulted my career into and so I can really tell, I mean, as a success life coach that I do, I have clients every single day via Zoom or I'm in front of people, hundreds or thousands of people every day. Help, help us understand what it is that I've known and asked people around you is, because I know why, but could you articulate, like, why is Shonea Havili always so positive and always talks in such a positive light and manner? in which case there's so much hope that resonates in every word that you say, as well as your mannerisms, Shone. Why? Wow, that's very kind of you. Um, you know, I think half the battle is, so I was lucky enough uh, when I played in high school, Vaisi Gehema, uh, his brother coached me in high school. His name was Cap. And so Vi ended up coming and giving us this pregame speech before one of our uh, our state championships. And it resonated with me when he talked about culturally, our people, the first thing that they did, our ancestors, is when they would land on an island, is that they would burn their canoes. Yeah. The reason why they would do that is that there is because the only way that they're getting off that island is that they would conquer that island, right? right. And so essentially, it, it made me realize as, I don't know, 16 to 17 year old, that that is the approach that I always needed to take in life. And that was something that my dad always taught me that, you know, nothing is given away, everything is earned. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I remember about those life lessons, I made a massive mistake when I was 18, 19 years old. And it could have easily derailed and I could have been in the prison system, you know, for a long time if I allowed that to perpetuate itself. But, I, I, I took ownership of it. I didn't blame anyone else, right? And that's what I think, you know, was the biggest, big, you know, thing for me to, to, to be able to do. And I think that mindset and always looking at everything, the glass half full rather than half empty uh, has, has really given me a perspective in life that, you know, I'm, I'm not a victim. You know, I'm, I'm the creator of my own success. And there's a piece of clay in front of me and I can go ahead and, and really mold that clay in anything that I wanted to. And I feel like that's been, that's been what my career has been in my life has been so far. I love that. I love that. And how much of this optimism, faith, and hope, as you talk about a family and the people that are, are anchored in their faith, um, that has come, let's start with your parents. What are the life lessons? And then what are the parenting uh, models that you gain from them? in terms of examples that you and your wife apply to raising your children today, Shoni? Yeah. So one of the things, you know, obviously when we talk about that foundational base in, in the savior, right? 
mm. in Jesus Christ. I mean, that's something mutually, regardless of, of, of religion, um, there's a scripture in Proverbs chapter three that, that says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, right. you know, at all times acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Right. You know, that's, that's kind of the premise and the foundation that I've always had in, in every aspect of my life. One thing that I, that I thought about early on, and, and it's interesting, you know, I, I've heard you talk about the conversion of, you know, Saul to Paul, right? Mm. And, you know, that, that I, you know, obviously I, I would never say that my life would mirror his, but there, I, I do love learning um, in, um, how, how would you say that? Uh, I, I do love learning based on, on stories, especially, especially ones that are doctrinal. Let's take, for example, um, the Good Samaritan, right? Sure. People yes, see the Good Samaritan, and he was able to help somebody that was stranded, that was in need, and to be able to take that person to the end, feed him. But the one thing that I think is, is, is not realized is that that individual, the Good Samaritan, was in a position of power That's right. and financial fortitude where he had the means to do that. And so essentially what my motivation has been, my dad always told us as we had these little family meetings every Monday, me as the oldest and all of my, my seven brothers and sisters is to always make a difference, to always give back, right? And those were the only things I didn't realize that to do that. But as I read that particular story, in order to be able to give back, to give something of value, you have to be in a position to do that whether it's intellectual or whether it's financial, whatever it might be. Oh, I love that. I love that. So in that, in your family home evenings and your once a week meetings, talk about, um, you know, your siblings and how growing up, I mean, that that isn't a normal American sized family, right? You grew up in, <laughs> in a big old family, right? Uh, and people always laugh, Shonda, because they're like, you're, you're really, are you related to Shonne Havili? I was like, Shonne Havili and then from Utah? I was like, yeah, Shonne is successful. I'm related to him. It's like, <laughs> I'm related to every successful Polynesian out there. You know how Polys are, right? Right, Shonne? Yeah, exactly. And that, talk about how, how did that further perpetuate? I love that word, perpetuate, about family and being in a surrounding with your siblings, so many of you. Yeah. Well, my dad told me as the oldest, anything that I did, right, the kids would follow as an example. And when I talk about uh, the upbringing that we had, again, reminder, my dad never made more than $45,000 a year. Right, right. Probably right. below the poverty line, but never once did he ever ask for help, um, you know, from, from church or, you know, from, from any public entity, because he was super prideful about providing for us. But he did instill that in us. And so in these family home evenings that we would have, it was always talking about how we could individually and collectively better each other. Um, one thing that we did, we didn't go out to eat much, right? And the only time that you got out to eat, and maybe, you know, Coach B, you can remember this, is if you end up going one-on-one -on -one with your parent to maybe a doctor's or a dentist. Mm. And then, you know, on the way home, you know, your dad would get you a happy meal and he'd tell you, yeah. eat as fast as you can. Um, <laughs> And I would feel so a little bit guilty. Yeah, I'd feel a little bit guilty, but but my dad was just like, all right, cool. We don't have the means. You either enjoy this, this is our one-on-one -on -one time, or you don't. I remember a scenario where we were going through the drive-thru. And if you remember, Big Macs and, and uh, Whoppers used to be 99 cents or a dollar. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, being the oldest of eight kids, my dad would yell back as we were in the drive-thru, you know, hey, you know, we'll get eight Whoppers or eight Big Macs. And anytime anyone wanted one with no onions, then it ended up turning to six or seven, like that individual could not get a unique order. It's, you just gotta be grateful for what you have. Yeah, what you get, yeah. And, you know, there was just this collectivistic uh, mindset that was instilled in us where early on, believe it or not, in my dating days, uh, because I felt bad that if I was going out on a date with my girlfriend or my wife now, the first thing that we would do is we'd go and buy food for my brothers and sisters so that they could enjoy the goodness that I'm gonna be enjoying, you know, when I'm on a date. And so that was, that was different. I think my wife was kind of at pause when she had, she had that first experience, but then it just showed her, man, you know, that that's all I'm about is family. And that's what we were talking about. That, that, that's awesome. In that, let's talk about, as you just mentioned, your wife, I, I, I often 
as people, because I get on interviews and I get asked on TV and radio and all that about like, what's the number one choice that you've ever made in your life? And I said, well, there's, there's a handful, but the number one choice that I've ever made that had the huge, the most significant consequence and benefit in my life is who I chose as a spouse. And, and I often talk about to college audiences about that beyond majors and what schools you want to commit to and or what what you want to do in life as a career. This is one significant decision that you do not want to take for granted or be casual in is, is a spouse. You already mentioned that she was there as your girlfriend before you went to prison and then you married her and you brought her up again, how significant was that choice in spouse in full commitment in sickness and in health till death do us apart? What, what we call in the streets, ride or die, right? <laughs> Which yeah. is just the vow, the commitment, right? Loyalty. How, how significant has she been to you and all you've done? And I love that question. I cannot downplay that by any means. Mm. Naturally, as they say, be, you know, I, I wouldn't say behind, beside a great yep. man, a great woman, right? And so, I mean, you take, for instance, I mean, just a poor kid from Salt Lake City, you know, and having to go through all of these trials and the one constant aside from my parents was my wife, mm. my girlfriend at the time. You know, she was the one that was able to stay there and be positive, you know, for and with me throughout my entire journey. So. You know, that, that, that's one thing you'll notice in really any successful, for the most part, I believe, businessman, if you notice that they have a very solid wife, that, they're, that, 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 that they can make solid business decisions. And I think that that was the most solid business decision that I've ever made in my life. And to this day, I will be forever indebted to her for going through everything that, that she has. I mean, there's a saying in my family that the harder you work, prior to, mer you know, the harder you work prior to marriage, the more beautiful that your wife will be. And mm. after everything that I've been through, I mean, if you've seen my wife, you'll know, you know, why I've been blessed because I've had to work so hard to earn that. Yeah, no doubt. That's awesome. In that we've come to the segment of the show. If you just joined us here on the Coach V show, we are on feature with Sione Habili here on the Coach V Show, where iron sharpens iron, together we rise. We're just finishing up the segment where we're just unpacking his genesis point to where he is today with some life lessons that come with. And in that, Sione, how do people get a hold of you? How do we find you? He, this is the third question. How do, how do people find you? How can we get a hold of you? And then what are the projects that you are able to talk about that you're really excited about right now, both in the community, Sione, please, and then also professionally? Yep. Yeah, you can reach me uh, via LinkedIn, via Facebook. Uh, you can reach me at my email. It's just my first and last name, sionehavili at gmail.com. Um, and I, I, the, Coach V, there was a question that you had mentioned earlier with regards to my story. So you can find my documentary uh, oh, yeah. produced by Vice Kahema, Angie Dennison, um, Sherry Du. Uh, it's on YouTube. Okay. And it's titled Redeem the Siona Habili Story. I'm also writing a book and it's titled From a Mormon Mission to Maximum Security. And so that'll be coming out in, in the next couple of years. Uh, I don't have the bandwidth to have it released soon. Uh, but those are the ways that you can reach out and get a hold of me. In terms of projects, you know, I'm, I'm going to be... I, I still, you know, obviously on the board of directors for the Utah Polynesian Professionals, I'm doing a lot with BYU Hawaii to proliferate uh, a lot of the talent that they have there to, you know, the APAC region and some of those tech companies there, as well as the U.S. Uh, we do host events every single month. Um, I'm passionate about mentoring, you know, as you'd read in the bio, Pacific Islanders, women, anyone in, you know, diverse backgrounds, as well as convicted felons into you know, just breakthrough job opportunities. And so the only thing I ask in return uh, with anyone that I work with is just to be able to continue and pass that forward. So those are the things that, that I'm working on long-term, excuse me, short-term. Uh, the the long-term is still a little bit blurry, but hopefully those things come to fruition soon. No, that, that, that's absolutely phenomenal. Again, Sione Havili, 
S-I-O-N-E-H-A-V-I-L-I -E at gmail.com. You could find his story, which I'm going to put on the link of my YouTube channel. And then also I'm going to put that link also on when we uh, air the show. And then so people can find that as well. So thank you for that. In that we've come to the portion of the show where we're going to just talk story with Shona and just talk about what's called the hot seat on the Coach V show. I'm just going to say a phrase or a statement and Shona is going to just tell us what he thinks about and what comes um, top of mind. In that, here's the first Coach V hot seat question, Brother Shona. As you talk about perpetuate, I coach, teach, and train about processes, replicable steps that re replicate uh, that replicate uh, specific outcomes, right? If not, you're just shooting from the hip. In that, you talk about perpetuate. So that means that if you change your actions, then you also change the outcome. If you better the actions or level up in your actions or activities, your performance and your execution, the results also attract um, such uh, of what it is that you're doing. Let's talk about perpetuate process. What comes to mind as you'd like to give uh, to us from the wealth of your experiences, both the success and uh, what it is that you've had to overcome in terms of the term perpetuate and process? Two things come to mind. Um, first of all, comfort is the enemy of progress. Right. Mm. And so anytime you find yourself in a situation where you're comfortable, where you don't, you do not feel like um, you're being challenged, step out of your comfort zone, right? And be able to do something, you know, that you've never done before. The second point, uh, you know, parlays on that last statement that I mentioned, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over without a different result. And if we can't break out of that cycle, um, you know, then certainly we're just going to find ourselves in a situation where we wake up every single day, not happy with our situation. And so I would, you know, venture out to say that we need to continually be challenged. Otherwise, we're getting weaker and we're not getting stronger in our lives. Very good. I love all of that. I love that response. So Nate, the next question is, um, what comes to mind when I say this, Coach V, quote, there's money in the transaction but the wealth is in the relationships. One more time, there's money in the transaction, but the wealth is in the relationships. Your thoughts on that, Brother Shonen? So it's, it's a perfect saying. And I love that saying primarily because um, it's just the way that we operate as specific honors, right? As I mentioned earlier in the show, Wealth is demonstrated by the more you give, mm. by what you receive. Um, I was in a, I was actually meeting with some executives uh, a couple months back where they asked me who I patterned my business after. And essentially in that room, some people were saying Warren Buffett, other people were saying, you know, just really high level executives. And they were caught off by the individual that I said, and it was Pablo Escobar. Mm. Pablo Escobar, if you do not know, he was the leader of the Medellin cartel, Colombia. And the reason why is it resonated most with me because he was from the slums. He grew up poor, mm. right? But he was resourceful. And yeah. so you think about the things that he had to do to take on Ronald Reagan. Now, now, Put aside that the things he did was illegal, yep. but his business was decimated multiple times and every single time he built it up, right? But you think about the situation. So I'm in, I'm in software sales. I manage a team. Um, and the difference of someone like me and Pablo Escobar being from the street and someone that has an MBA is you can't learn the things that we were taught from the neighborhood, Coach B, mm -hmm. from a book. And what I mean by that is you take Pablo Escobar, El Chapo Guzman, right? Mm -hmm. These individuals or people like us had to manage territories, had to manage people and had to hit a number, but it wasn't about hitting a number or not hitting a number. It was about life or death, right? And so those are the things that, that, that propel. And again, 
you know, obviously illegal things aside, they were able to provide for all those around them that helped put them on a pedestal of success that is really unmirrored to, to some of the success that you've seen even in, in legal business. And I know that's way outside the box, but nope, man- Not for me, I get what you're saying, but not for me. I love that example. <laughs> I love that example. And my wife is always like, why do you keep watching these like mafia movies and these cartel movies on Netflix? And I'm like, it's so intriguing. It's like, if people can illegally figure out how to make Forbes Fortune 100, that's illegal. Why couldn't we figure out how to do it legally? <laughs> I agree. Oh, that's crazy. I agree. And, and so that's the thing is, yeah, I, you know, obviously I'm in a director position and I'm in software sales. But Coach V, the reason why I'm successful is this is a legal hustle. That's right? real talk. And so we take the things that we've learned where we had to survive and now we've taken it in a corporate structure and we've been able to elevate ourselves. But again, it's a very disruptive thought process. Yeah. It's thinking outside the box. It's not something that you can learn in school. It's something that, that you have to be taught by life. That's right. That's right. That, yeah, that's right. There, there is no passive passenger in this thing called success. You got to go <laughs> out there and make it happen. No, and I love that. And, and, and one of the things that I love that I watch in these, like these illegal empires, right, is really what I coach, teach, and train in terms of effective communication. So the next question is, effective communication is really the sending and or receiving information in the way that it was intended. But as I find is why I get hired in these Fortune 1,500 and 100 companies that I have no relevant experience or expertise is because I can communicate on that level. And they always talk about creating buy-in, Shilman. And I'm like, you could do that or you could be like Pablo Escobar and do what's called winning hearts and minds. This thing is about life and death and really understanding the gravity of every one of our choices and how we execute on this vision. Right. And that when you win hearts and minds of the people, then they can really effectively now receive the information in, in terms of the communication on a level that's different. You create a different level of urgency and loyalty and um everybody's looking to hire and I'm talking about retention and hiring people that you attract because you can effectively communicate where you're winning hearts and minds is the question. Winning hearts and minds versus creating buy-in. Is there a difference in your opinion, uh, uh, Shonen? No, I mean, you said it right. One thing that I've learned and I know is that people buy people, right? Mm. And if you conduct business, if you conduct your relationships with people, uh, one thing that Jabari Parker's dad said, Sonny Parker, is you need to be the same person in the light that you are in the dark. Real talk. Right? And if you have fortified relationships where people, your friends, are going to tear you up to your face but build you up behind your back, then you've done well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's for me, of all the awards and accolades that I get, and people are like, well, what, what, what is a win for you in terms of relationships? Is like people say to me, it's like, V, I'm around you in Hollywood. I'm around you when we're at these fundraisers. I'm around you when you're serving kids in the community for free. I'm around you when you speak. I'm around you at the VIP dinners. And you're like the same cat. That's a win for me. Because that means I don't have to do what's called masquerade. It is put on something that I'm not. Now, I'm not saying because a lot of people also say, right, Shona, they say, you know, just be yourself. That's going to be good enough. Oh. I don't know if the market will always respond to that, but I know that the marketplace will always have a return on you being the best version of yourself, the most professional and the person that can perform and execute on what they committed to in terms of their mission of themselves. So that's a roundabout deal, just talking about being real uh, and what I call the master in the art of living. Center, right? Because really, real quickly, and then you could respond. The master in the art of living makes little distinction between their work and their play, their labor and their leisure, their information and their recreation, their love and their religion. They don't distinguish which is which. They simply pursue a level of excellence or hustle, Pablo Escobar, Warren Buffett, <laughs> Shonen Habili, and all that they do, right? And they let other people decide whether it is if they're working or playing, but to him or her, Right, Shona, and to you, me, and we, we are always doing both. 
-hmm. in terms of that hustle. Come on, Sheldon, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, my, I just have one, one thought and that's Deion Sanders. I remember when Deion Sanders was first drafted, we all know Deion is prime time, but every, he, he, basically he was accused that when he was drafted and he made it to the NFL, that he changed. Mm. Saying that he said that has resonated with me ever since I heard that saying. And that he said, he said, when I made it, I didn't change. It was everyone else that changed around me, right? Mm. And so when you look at Dion, he's the same Dion. And I bet he was the same Dion when he was in college as he is now at Jackson State. Right. But, you know, obviously, if you, if you stay to the same values and you, you know, conduct yourself this, the, the way that you always have, you know, essentially that, that's something that you can, you know, live your, your life uh, in a way that, you know, you can be happy with. Uh, I, love that. I love that over at Jackson State getting the number one recruit in America <laughs> <laughs> that, that Dion in that uh, thank you to everybody that has tuned in here to the Coach V show on our feature of Brother Shona Havili Shona it's been such a pleasure to have you not only because of the value it is that you bring and how you articulate it on such another, uh, such a high level, but it's just another sense and feeling to have another Tongan brother on here um, that both of us are on here just talking shop about life and to do so in a setting like this, that is really created and designed to bring value to other people. I just really appreciate your time and that I know that you're so busy, but I would ask that you just give a final final and that you have the final word on this call. And really, do you have a message to the world? And you could take two to three minutes. We got time before we have to sign off. Please, Brother Sione, the platform is yours. Yeah, no, first of all, I, I do want to give um, a shout out, if that's yep. cool. Yeah, absolutely. Talk we miss shout outs. Please give shout outs. Please. Yeah, my parents, you know, I've, I've had life and career mentors. You know, Ron McBride, who I never even ended up getting to really play for, uh, you know, Vice Kehema, mm. uh, my buddy, Brian Massina, Lee Ortel, like these are life mentors that I leverage every single day. Um, you know, career mentors, there have been people that have given me a chance, you know, from Jason Koo to Rick Tolman, um, you know, to Keith White, Jeff Skousen, RJ Tracy. And, and when it talks about like, it takes a village, um, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough where by way of proximity, you know, mm. I had my, my mom and her three sisters that lived close around me. And so they were always there. If my mom said no uh, to anything that I was able to have, really that my aunties, you yeah, know, yeah. I didn't let old Sana, you know, there by me every single day. But, but really my, my, my pearls and, and my last thought of wisdom, and this is just to people um, and, to, and, and to parents, right? In my personal situation, there are no mistakes that you can ever make in your life that you cannot recover from. Mm. Right? And a lot of people, they're in dire circumstances. A lot of people look at social media, but what I see is that social media nowadays is the thief of joy, right? People are measuring themselves, not against themselves, but against others. And a lot of that is, you know, I, I would say somewhat fabricated. And so with that said, you know, keep your head up. Keep your face strong, you know, keep your eye on the prize and don't ever let up, you know, based on anything that you guys can, because you can achieve anything you want in your life. And I'm a testament of that. Amen and amen. And shout out to your shout outs uh, for helping <laughs> produce just such an amazing human being that happens to be a Tongan brother. Uh, shout out to your village, shout out to, to Glendale and and shout out to that part of Utah, shout out to all the schools. I mean, that's just awesome that yeah, your experience and thank you Shona, for being you to us, uh, the many of us that look to you. Um, and it doesn't matter to me that you're younger. I mean, I just see value as value and you're definitely one that is definitely wise beyond your years. And definitely not just because of what you say, but what you do and your ability to now reach back and do what Tongans do. Not only do we give out of our poverty, but we also give out of prosperity like the Good Samaritan. And when I'm asked is, why do you do what you do for kids? Because I can. And I appreciate that you would also and are doing the same. 
So thank you everyone for tuning in to the Coach V Show right here on Island City where the beach meets the streets and here on your Hollywood personal development radio show where iron sharpens iron together we rise and just for Siona and I we're not just trying to do this for the sake of your success but really for the sake that you be your best in doing so you realize the best of your abilities and that everything that you dream and work for can be achieved this is how Siona Havili and your boy coach V lives all about faith and family grateful for God's amazing grace. Until next Mono Motivations Monday, thank you so much for tuning in. Signing out from Utah and your boy Coach V here in Elk Grove, broadcast out of Hollywood, California. Until next time, one love, mad respects, live it. Peace.